can only say that it's very unfortunate that some officials in DOD were not aware of these vital factors in preparing for the invasion of Iraq. Yeah. Alas, that's true. Because the Arabic situation, I understand, is in bad shape. Oh, it is. And they're, I mean, I was talking to some people at Monterey the other day. They, they've got a whole sort of hodgepodge of uh, former students, contractors. There are these companies that claim they can you know, you push a service. button you want Arabic, we'll give you Arabic. You want Bulgarian, we'll give you Bulgarian. Come on, we're just we're just we're just chatting. We really haven't started yet. Ah, oh, thanks. There's a creamer and a sugar. Would you like that? I will. I will. Let me come do it myself. I'll bring it. Pedro, I don't Thank you. Dear. We can do this in a relaxed fashion too. We, there's nothing wrong with seeing. No. But I thought we should try to go back and pick up a little bit on your background before you, you know. Mm -hmm. Got to UCLA before you got Marines, whatever, uh, and then of course talk about what happened when you, you know, uh, with with this Savala school. And I was particularly curious to be curious to hear a little more about when you were in New Zealand and with me, if you remember anything about. Yeah, that. It was after the Guadalcanal operation. And, and yeah. If you remember anything about working with with Happy Moran. Well, that was on the canal. He was the with canal. the first division, yeah. and I was with the second division. You were with second division, but as I understand, they came over. You got second we were, was on Tulagi, right? And then it came over to Tulagi. No, canal. we were, we were in American Samoa. You were in Samoa, okay, and so then came. they landed there on August the seventh. Right. And we, it, things got pretty bad, as you may recall. Oh, yes, indeed. And so they needed some reinforcement for the division, so they just simply picked up the 8th Marines reinforced from Samoa uh, okay. and took us down and we landed there about late September so about a month uh, uh, of 42 and were assigned to the 1st Division, so that gave them four regiments instead of three. So you became, okay, so you became at that point part of the 1st Division? Yeah, we were re first Marine Division reinforced, <laughs> gotcha. okay. and I worked with the General Vandergriff's staff and and Pappy Moran for both Elmer and I did for probably a month or so, and then elements of the Second Division headquarters came up from New Zealand. I see. And by that paper? time, by that time, you see the on the original landing. One regiment from the second division went with the first, the second marines. They went with them at the initial landing. We came in about September, and then following that, the six marines came back from Iceland, <laughs> which we'll see on that map, and came down to the canal. They got there probably around late November, early December. So at that point, we had all three of our regiments there, and the 1st Division picked up and went back to Australia. Oh, I see. Taking so, Pappy with them. <laughs> so it was kind of, a, in a sense, a sort of piecemeal commitment. Feed in. Feed of, in, of, yeah. Of available yeah. forces yeah. as okay. you got shipping, and, <laughs> and the Japanese were not in the way. <laughs> OK. This is a lot of it doesn't really matter. When, when you were on the canal, did you actually work you know, in the same Small unit with Pappy Moran, or well, or we, you were with you were with the. With the I was with with the Eighth Marines. Okay, I was the regimental language officer, and the, our own division was still in New Zealand, so it was obvious thing to do was work with the guy who was there. And Pappy and I were doing most of the work with the very few POWs that were extant on Guadalcanal. There were some down to aviators that had been pulled out of the water and a few naval survivors and stuff like that. And not too many, the Army people were mostly KIA. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. these were the people that we worked with. And uh, hmm. then when the 1st Division left, they took most of those people with them to Australia, got them off the island. Got them out of there. Uh, so you were there for the, after that, for the latter part of it. On into to the spring of forty three, to February. Yeah, of we we the second Marine Division pulled out of there in February of forty three, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and turned it over to the Army. The Army brought in the I think it was the twenty fifth Army Corps, mm -hmm. and so I have at that point was the senior guy who'd been there, 
So they moved me over to work with the Army. Now, at, at this point, I still, this will I understand clearly, you were still enlisted at that point, right? No, I was a captain. Okay, you were a captain by that time. Yeah, I, I got my commission in, in April of 41. Okay, I see. You got your commission in April so of 41. So I was basically an infantry officer, but I had been a language major across the road over here. Okay. French and Spanish. I see. So when they started looking around for people to take Japanese, they said, you will volunteer. And, and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back a little bit. Uh, am I right? You, you were born here in Los Angeles? Yeah. On what year would that have been? 1918. Okay, right when? Day after Christmas. <laughs> okay. can, can you give us a complete sentence? Where in Los Angeles were you born? Where were you born in Los Angeles? Do you know Silver Lake area out toward Glendale? Well, I lived out there. My father had a pharmacy on 2500 Sunset Boulevard, and uh, I worked in his pharmacy uh, after schools and that sort of thing, and went to John Marshall High School, which was an outstanding school. It was brand new and just great, up near Griffith Park. And uh, when I completed that, at that point, if you had the grades, you could just move directly into UCLA. Mm -hmm. And it was within driving distance, so uh, I commuted for a year and then eventually moved on campus. Okay, well, at that time UCLA was already out here, not still it had moved. It had moved from Vermont Avenue out to Westwood. Yeah. About 19, about early 30s, about 1934 or something like yeah, that. Yeah, my, my mom started it at Vermont Avenue. Did it. She, I think she was the first. Oh, she to moved with out there. Yeah, she, she moved. Um, but anyway, you you went to high school, uh, went to UCLA. What what prompted you to major in languages when you were at UCLA? Uh, I actually changed my major a couple of times, but finally, some helpful member of the faculty said, "What are you doing best in?" And I said, "Well, I'm doing pretty good in French." He said, "Well, then why don't you major in it?" Uh -huh. And my mother had been a teacher, and I thought, well, all right, so maybe I can wind up teaching French. Had you ever, for example, you know, gone to Europe or gone to Mexico no, or I, anything like that? Just French restaurants in L.A. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, now, at UCLA, how do we get a connection with the military at all? You, let's see, what year would it have been that you started at UCLA? I started in 36. 36. So you Graduated would be in 40. Wow, so you graduated when the big events are happening in Europe. Yeah, uh, oh yeah. It was, wars. Uh, mm -hmm. So... Were you in R ROTC or anything like it, that? It was mandatory. Oh, it was mandatory. The first two years, every male student had to take ROTC. And at, at the beginning of your junior year, you could make a choice of taking what they called advanced ROTC, which led to a reserve commission in the Army in, upon graduation. And I elected to take Spanish instead. <laughs> and, Had your uh, father been in the military or anything like no, that? No, my father question? was a Brit. And although he was a U.S. citizen, he, he was too young for... Uh, he had a family by the time World War I came along, so... Uh, yeah, he, he wouldn't have done that. I see. Okay. So you, you were in ROTC, you elected to do Spanish, not... Not Continue follow up on the military. Follow up the military. And so then, how do we get you in the Marine? Marines? Well, by the time I was in my senior year, the draft board was looking rather hungrily in direction, and as soon as you graduated from college, you were eligible. And uh, the rules of the game were we had a, a Army ROTC and a Naval ROTC at UCLA, but they could not, for that reason, the Marine Corps could not talk to undergraduates. So as soon as I graduated, I was approached by a Marine recruiter type offering me the opportunity to go to this commissioning class at Quantico. And uh, looking around my fraternity at the guys who were going to be wind up as Army officers, I decided maybe it would be better to get out of there. <laughs> uh, I might get killed. So I, I took the Marine offer and uh, I finished just one semester of, of graduate school in education and then 
got the call up order and went back to Quantico mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. was commissioned in April of 41. So you went through the sort of the basic officers? Yeah, it was called the candidate's training. class in uh, reserve officers training. Mm -hmm. And I wound up as a second lieutenant in the reserve and shipped directly to the second marine division in San Diego. So when would it have been roughly when you would have gotten out to San Diego then? Before uh, Pearl Harbor? September, oh yeah, so about late August, early September of 41, and I was assigned to a 30 caliber machine gun platoon as a platoon leader, and we were out guarding Miramar, what is now Miramar Airfield, with 30 caliber machine guns on carts. It was, I would have really been <laughs> very deadly, I'm sure. <laughs> And that when we, then in the course of events, I was moved into 81 millimeter mortars. And at the time we went to Samoa, we left San Diego just a month after Pearl Harbor. On Do you remember where you were on Pearl Harbor Day and what happened or what you felt? Yeah, I had been to the SC UCLA football game, Weekend Liberty and a big party afterwards and I uh, woke up Sunday morning and all oh, hell had broken loose. So I just jumped in my car and took off for San Diego. Mm -hmm. And you probably expected pretty quick you're going to go. Oh yeah, we, we were, our unit, the 8th, was scheduled to relieve or attempt to relieve the, the operation at Wake Island. But by the time they got shipping together and pulled all the stuff together, it was just too late, they were, they were gone. So then they said, well, the next possible target for the Japanese to interrupt the, the shipping lines to Australia would be to get to take American Samoa, because it was a fantastic harbor and it was a naval base. And so we were sent there. Mm -hmm. And uh, then once we arrived there, I went out and set up my mortars to cover landing beaches and that sort of thing. And then one day, the battalion commander calls up and says, uh, this intelligence officer at brigade headquarters wants to talk to you. I had been on the ship coming out on, with the division headquarters, same ship, mm -hmm. and had worked with this guy uh, and translating and censoring our Hispanic troops' mail. There would have been a significant number well, of Hispanic We had Hispanic a lot. Troops yeah, we, we had brought in a Texas Reserve Battalion shortly before we left the States, and they were all sort of scattered throughout the unit. And we had a lot of them, and of course their parents didn't speak any English, so. Yeah. So aboard ship, uh, that was my job, and uh, I got to know this officer, Ferdinand Bishop, who uh, later be became the director of the school. Did he talk to you then about the idea of, well, hey, maybe you should no, do Japanese? No, it wasn't, it wasn't like firm aboard ship. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't until we got to Samoa and he was able to sit down with the brigade intelligence officer, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Bales, and uh, that was decided, and with pressure from Vandergrift, uh, who had, was assistant commandant and had been in China and knew about the language problems, that, that the Marine Corps started doing this, so they organized this school. I'm trying to remember, Andrew, you might remember. Bales, wasn't he? In, was he not in he China? He was a Chinese language officer based in China. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was Chinese language, but uh, he was, at the brigade level, was put in charge of language development. And had and he not, was he ever in O&I? Yes, and then he was, run, once the war started, then he was in O&I. Gotcha. Oh, after Samoa. After Samoa. Yeah, because once our unit left and uh, <laughs> the and Samoa by that time this was after Midway was considered fairly safe, so they pulled the major troop unit out and left the uh, aircraft and some Seabees uh, uh, and whatever guarding the the base, and the the brigade staff was just uh, funneled off and individually. Uh, Major Bishop wound up as aide to General Upshur and went on a reconnaissance flight into the Aleutians and they crashed and were never heard from yeah. again. Yeah, lost fairly early. Yeah. But, but before that, do you think it was probably this you know, chance of spending the time with him on the ship that may have 
learned well, it in he the knew back, my he name. knew languages. Yeah, he, he knew my languages. name and he knew I'd have been a language student. Mm -hmm. And what he was doing selectively was trying to go through the <laughs> whatever backup he had on individual personnel in the, in the regiment to find people like Elmer Stone and Croyle who'd had, uh, Elmer went to uh, junior college Fullerton. Croyle had done some JC work in Seattle. So those were the kind of guys he was reaching for. How did you feel about this? I mean, here you're trained to be, you know, a Marine. And we're in this war all of a sudden, and you think you're going to go off, you know, with your mortar unit or mm -hmm. whatever, and then they kind of yank you off and say, okay, you're going to do this language thing for six months. Was well, that a problem? You, or? After I'd been in by, maybe by <laughs> a year and a half, I learned that <laughs> when you get a directive, you move. <laughs> So and it, it turned out, to, of course, to be interesting. And uh, fortunately, this guy Bishop was just a first-class instructor. Mm. He not only on Japanese spoken, uh, conversational in the, the Naganuma series, but military. He put a great. He had, had studied that aspect of it in the Tokyo Embassy School, and he he learned it well. So we covered all that. He covered all of Pacific geography because he knew damn good and well we were going to wind up somewhere out there. So that we were brought up to date with the major shipping routes, what the Japanese uh, World War I uh, legacies were in the Pacific, the Marianas and the Carolines and all that. So we had a pretty good idea of where the hell the action might be. Mm -hmm. How about, did he talk to you at all about his, you know, his own experiences in pre-war Japan or what the Japanese, he thought what the Japanese were like as people or anything like that? Well, he, I, actually he studied with Naganuma out there at that school, <laughs> uh, which is one reason he adopted the course. Uh, he got along pretty well. He said he wasn't harassed too much. He was just attached to the embassy as uh, out of the office of naval attache mm -hmm. and uh, as long as they stuck to the school and didn't get too near military bases he said we didn't have any trouble mm -hmm. and uh, that, that would have been a time though you know when you're there pretty bad things are being saying about the Japanese did he ever have anything good to say about the Japanese no I would say he was pretty objective uh, he obviously had uh, first generation Japanese as instructors and I don't remember exactly where he lived uh, around the embassy somewhere but I'm sure it was probably a, a mixed neighborhood kind of thing. I, I lived in one when I was out there as attache. Uh, hmm. No, he, he was and as I mentioned, I think in my notes there, he, uh, we had the only grocery store on the island was owned by this Japanese guy, uh, Shimazaki. <laughs> but the problem with Shimazaki was he was a uh, uh, from uh, uh, Shimonoseki, uh, and the, the language was. <laughs> He came in and talked to us a couple of times, and Bishop could barely get along with him, and we just sat there and watched. <laughs> the accent would have been pretty... <laughs> oh, it was real primitive, I'll tell you. <laughs> what, what were your personal views of the Japanese when the war started? You know, like people at Dower have argued, you know, American nation was angry, seeking vengeance. Well, how did you feel towards Japan? Well, of course, as a military person, I was, uh, I was not terribly surprised if you... You guys lived on the West Coast. People on the West Coast were pretty well aware that there was a big threat out there. And uh, but I lived in a neighborhood there off of Sunset Boulevard. My dad next, just down the block from my dad's store, there was a Japanese uh, yaoya, mm -hmm. and uh, I knew this man. And I knew his two sons lived near us, maybe a block and a half apart. We played together with those kids regularly, so. I mean, as far and we had other Japanese in the grade school with us. I remember a fellow by the name of Takashita, whom I ran into at a reunion. Maybe it wasn't the Boulder; it was a high school reunion. And he he had been interned. 
But uh, so, uh, the hell, the whole, the whole that Griffith Park area was just loaded with Japanese gardeners. <laughs> Every other truck was a Japanese gardener at that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a big surprise. Uh, I mean, there, I didn't feel any hostility toward these people. I knew them well, and they weren't a threat. Had you ever had Japanese food before you went off to? Uh I'd never studied the language at all, no. No, not the language. No, I was thinking of, of food. You're talking about oh, you know, yeah, relating sure. to, you know, yeah, neighbors, oh, basically. Oh, yeah. yeah. The usual common stuff, various kinds of rice and mm -hmm. shrimp and whatever. Mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't... But as a young Marine, you know, did, did you go out with this gung-ho feeling, well, we're going to seek vengeance, we got to beat back the Japanese? Mm -hmm. Well, since it was Marine units that, that, uh, us, that really got, took a lot of the clobbering at the Pearl Harbor time, there was the Wake Island detachment, mm -hmm. there was the detachment at Guam. The 4th Marines had pulled out of Shanghai and were in the Philippines and fighting in Bataan. So uh, we, these were, <laughs> I didn't know many of the people, I was too new, but these, these were the buddies of my commanding officers. So yeah, there was uh, some real hard feelings in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and. I don't think we were any under any illusions about how difficult it was going to be. Uh, a number of our officers, like this fellow Bales and others, had been out on China duty and had seen the Japanese in operation out there, and uh, there was no doubt in their mind that this was going to be a tough war. You think they conveyed that to you? I mean, that the Japanese, in a narrowly military sense, I mean, really knew their stuff. Well. They convinced us that the Japanese knew the area that we were going into better than we did. And when you're in the infantry, terrain is the, is the key to things. If you really know what you're doing on the ground, you're in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. And certainly the initial landings in the Solomons uh, was a, the closest thing that the Marine units I knew of had had to that was uh, some training down in Vieques off of Puerto Rico, which is a tropical island, but it's it's more like Catalina. It's sort of a desert island. There's no jungle, mm -hmm. and uh, so it was a this jungle warfare thing was a totally new experience. Hmm. By the time you were going to go from Samoa to Guadalcanal, uh, did you have any idea of you know the nature of the fighting or the intensity of it there, or was it just we're going to go and we'll find out when we get there? Oh, we were getting feedback. Uh, it was coming back to us through Hawaii. Uh, FMF PAC was there in Honolulu, in at Pearl. Uh, yeah, we were we were getting pretty close uh, r radio contact through all navs and that sort of stuff that was flowing in, and. Certainly, we, we we found out about the results of Midway with a lot of enthusiasm, <laughs> and uh, we knew that the initial assault on the canal was quite successful, but hard fought uh, on Tulagi, certainly. Did you know about, uh, I, mentioned, I saw one of the things you'd written, that they later named it like a Camp Getke. Did you know about the Getke Patrol and what had happened to the, oh, the first well Japanese we, Well, I didn't know about it until I got there, but uh, when, once I started working at division headquarters, I sure knew about it. <laughs> How did you feel about that? I mean, that they'd sent these guys out, you know, Well, right away. Uh, again, I think just inexperience uh, to send a, an outfit out like that without enough cover for them. And, uh, so certainly there was there was no naval cover for him from the sea. Mm -hmm. They were just in small boats and up there. And mm -hmm. We got up close to where they landed. Uh, we were sent up to the, uh, the Tenero River and uh, along, oh, that point crews along that set up a line up there and this was pretty close to the area where they landed and it, it, was, it was tough. Yeah, yeah. Heavily forested, narrow beaches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When did you first come into contact with Pappy Moran? This would have been... Oh, I'd say a matter of a week or ten days after we landed. Uh, our, we were the 8th Marines being brand new on the island. We were in reserve. And uh, 
the division found out that we had these language trained people in the eighth, and the only guy that they had was Pappy Moran and Gene Boardman. Gene was actually with the 2nd Marines, the 2nd Marine Division unit, but had landed initially with the 1st the, uh, Division. So they had these two officers. And, and only those two? Huh? And only those two, I think. No, right? and Freddie Wolf. Okay, Freddie Wolf. Who was a BIJ and uh, no formal school training other than what he got in Japan itself. Uh, and I mean, he had every, every slang word that was in the dictionary he had it he was very voluble on <laughs> what kind of a guy was he he I mean for him he would have been just volunteered into the marines or, or, or uh, this he, i think he, he i think he volunteered in and he was given a commission because of his, his far eastern experience and language uh i'd never worked with him on guadalcanal but after I came back after two years in the Pacific. He was at Camp Pendleton, or Camp Elliott, in that school that was down there and that moved up to Pendleton. Mm. And he was the director of that school at that time. Really? And he was not much of a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> he was not an academic in any respect. Uh, but I gather that, I think, I forget which regiment he was with. I think he was with Chesty Puller. Okay. Uh, on the canal, but he he was not used very much in his language capacity. They used uh, him for Pappy, of course, was fluent, but didn't have the military background. So I had a kind of a backup position there, a, a, a better military vocabulary than he had, but he could take to these guys and just chat them up forever, so. Yeah, I think I saw something where he, he supposedly actually, you know, laid down by the side of these guys when they were wounded and would talk to them to kind of, you know, cozy up to them to get them to talk. Oh, yeah. No, he was that? very effective. Uh, no, he was that? very effective. Uh, but he never had the training of, well, you know, other than name, rank, and serial number of getting, all right, now, where was your unit formed? What kind of weapons were you given? Now, when you first shipped out, which, where did you go first, and how did you get down to there, and what kind of ships were you on? And that sort of business uh, it just sort of wasn't in his background. So that's where you came in, then, right? Yeah, because yeah. Bishop they, had trained us They do that. this. I mean, you got a prisoner, your this, this was a... a Division headquarters, right, where they would well, do the we had a or? compound out in the brush somewhere there. <laughs> so you all three sort of or all worked together there, and they'd bring somebody in and yeah. I see. One thing that was kind of interesting: the Japanese prisoners were very unhappy about the fact that they only got fed twice a day, and of course, our rations were so thin. Our units had all been put on twice a day <laughs> rations. So we said, we're sorry about that, friend, but that's what we get and that's what you get. <laughs> but uh, they, they said, we eat three times a day. <laughs> <laughs> that's remarkable. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, did, did, do you think that, that uh, Pappy Moran, you know, how should I put it, thought of you people like yourself? As, as competent or well, you know, we just oh, got to have these military good, folks in or what? He knew well that our conversation was uh, uh, limited. Uh, we could get so far with a guy about his hometown and this sort of stuff, but when he started going, getting into his family background and a lot of stuff like that, we, we, okay. <laughs> and we didn't know the internal Japanese geography anywhere near as well as Moran did. He mm -hmm. traveled a lot as a missionary. and. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, at that point, am I right? There were no army Nisei around at that. Point. Well, there were no army on the island. No, not that, not that early. No, it would have been when the, very late. When the when the the corps moved in, they had no Nisei that I ever saw. In fact, they were pretty thin on Japanese. <laughs> they were in worse shape than the Marines at that point. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I think. The army units were sort of 
eyeballed with the idea that they were going to go to Europe. And they really didn't zero themselves in on the idea that somebody was going to pick up an outfit in Texas or someplace and say, okay, Jack, you're, you're, you're going on, on the Pacific. You're going the other way around, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so you're working with him in there and then... This was uh, General Patch, who was the uh, mm -hmm. Corps commander. That's a question I wanted to ask you. Some people have suggested that one of the problems early in the war was that more senior officers would, would come in and they wouldn't know, you know, what questions to ask the prisoners of war, what kinds of things to... Did, did, did you have any experience like that or did, they just, no. or did you have a set pattern of questions you're going to ask them or...? The senior de uh, officers on Guadalcanal had very damn little interest in the POWs other than what the hell can you find out about this or that and that's how many units are over there. And on the ground information was all they gave a damn about. Yeah. And uh, if we could provide that, they were very happy. How how was who who did made the decision about okay when we're you know we've got all the, all we're going to get out of this guy the prisoner uh, what do we do with them did, was, were you guys involved in that well or was that just turn them over to the Marines put them in the stockade and let them they somebody just else stayed decide? in the stockade until uh, I mean our shipping situation was was really bad at that point the Navy had had taken off. So there was really no way to lift these people out of there. If there was space on a ship, we were getting wounded out. Mm -hmm. So uh, it wasn't until the first division picked up as a unit that the, there was space to put prisoners on. And then when we moved out in February, uh, Elmer and I were put in charge of POWs that were being pulled back to New Zealand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then when we got there, they were taken over by the New Zealand Army and sent up to a POW camp at Featherston, which is mm -hmm. north of, of yeah, Wellington. Like Wellington. Yeah. Just take you back before that a little bit. Uh, still back in Guadalcanal, you mentioned Gene Boardman. Did you actually work with him or you have any uh, recollection oh yeah, of him? Because, I mean, basically they were our, our division. So, and our, the two commanders, our commander, Je uh, Colonel Jeske and, and uh, Doggy Arthur in the, in the second, were, had known each other for years, I think in China. So there was a lot of back and forth, and I saw Gene fairly regularly. Hmm. But Gene didn't have any, anybody behind him, and I lucked out with the, all of these kids from the school in Samoa we had people in each regiment mm -hmm. and then down at the battalion level. Even at the battalion level? You oh know. yeah, we, Elmer was in the 3rd Battalion 8th, he still goes to their reunions, and Bill Coyle was in the 1st Battalion, which had been my original battalion. At the end of the school, I was detached from my 1st Battalion 8th and moved up as regimental assistant regimental intelligence officer and language officer. at regimental headquarters. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that for a minute? At this point they actually had a separate, you know, title position section called for language, right? Well, they you were just or was that were, just like you a were lateral duty as the <laughs> assistant as to Japanese language. Officer. Okay, parent yeah. Japanese language. I, I see. But I also, you know, worked within the intelligence section about well going up to the OP and we set up an OP up on the top of uh, Mount Tapachog as it was up in Samoa there up over the Pango Harbor and we had to get supplies up there and keep that thing operational. Yeah. So really you, you were doing regular intelligence officer duties yeah. besides being the Japanese language, but being the language officer. And then generally speaking supervising what was happening with the guys who had been with me in the school since right. they became my responsibility. Language structure in the regiment. Did you, when then, when they're you know sprinkled around to the regiments and even down to the battalion level, did you, as you know, from the division level, did you could go around occasionally and kind of see how things oh, are going. Oh yeah, kind I of a supervisory. Kept in, I kept function? in touch, and, and then of course, once we got off the canal and uh, on the canal, I was principally working as a an officer out of division headquarters uh, away from my regiment because they were short up there 
just with just Pappy. And then when the second division came in, well, John Pelzell was there. And so I, then I started working with John oh. again at the division level. But in between those two, once uh, the first division pulled out, the Army Corps was there, and the next thing I knew, I was assigned to Corps headquarters for oh well, maybe three or four weeks. I see. Okay. And just brought them up to date with what the hell we'd been doing up to now. <laughs> yeah. So that's it. Could you tell us a little bit about John Pelzell? We tried to talk. Oh, John, I knew very well, and I kept in touch with him after the war. I finally lost track of him. He was, the last time I talked with him, he was in Phoenix. And I, I've never been able to, never Bob Sheeks was been after me to, can't we find him? Uh, uh, Bob joined joined us in New Zealand. Right, it would have been a little later, not, not yeah. on the canal. Uh, How was John, what was John Pelzell's language skills like? Or do you have any idea? Well, he went to that Hawaii. Yeah, he went to the Hawaii. I knew he went to the Hawaii. As Boardman did also. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, John, of course, had been in Asian studies for some time, not all of it language, but he had a big interest in it. And I gathered that he he was a proficient scholar and he mm -hmm. absorbed a lot of Japanese, a lot more than our group got in that six months that we were in it. Yeah. And I guess later he Because he moved from Hawaii to Berkeley, as I recall it, didn't he? I don't think he... At the time of Pearl Harbor? I don't Harbor? think so. He, 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 he went, if I've got it right, he, he was in Hawaii and they had him do kind of odd, not, to say odd jobs is not the right thing, but various kinds of jobs right after Pearl Harbor. And then when they really organized that second division, they sent him down there. Oh, yeah, well, so, so I don't think he went back. Yeah, the second there. division headquarters was on the Marine Corps base in San Diego there. Yeah, it would have been. Next to the recruit depot. Right, right down in the heart of San Diego. Yeah, old General Barney Vogel was CG then. And uh, so that's where the division headquarters was. And, and uh, But Vogel was moved up to the senior Marine for the whole West Coast. And they assigned a new officer as the division commander. And then they went out. And they went down to New Zealand. New Zealand, yeah. And they, okay. They went from San Diego to New Zealand and regrouped down there and then brought that headquarters up and put them in charge of the 2nd and the 8th. And then, then the 6th came in from Iceland and there we were all together. And then you're together, finally. Let, let's go back to, you know, you mentioned earlier taking, you know, accompanying the prisoners back from, from Guadalcanal down to New Zealand. Um, did, did you actually keep on interrogating them, or was it just a question of sort of? Oh, it know, was just a management thing, <laughs> seeing what the, how the ship wanted to handle them, and making sure that they, that this was what was being done, and answering any questions that the ship had about these people and what do we feed them and that sort of thing. And how did the? I mean, do they have any contact? Did the ordinary sailors see these guys? Have any everything about that? They, they didn't see them? much of them. They were down in the brig area down. <laughs> And uh, yeah. Yeah, let's follow, because Frank wrote an opinion piece, you know, saying that how we did it differently as interrogators in the Pacific as to what's going on in Iraq today. Yeah. He said, you know, we would play volleyball with them. You know, we would just solicit information quite differently. So informally, so to yeah. speak. Well, how, how did it work for you? You know, at well, this stage, uh, in the yeah, early stage. At that early stage. On the canal, we kept these guys pretty in pretty close. Uh, confinement because uh, if they got out of there, they'd be dead. Somebody would shoot them, sure as hell. <laughs> so, uh, you're, you're their protectors as well really, as their keepers. Yeah, their we keepers. were there to sort of <laughs> enforce the Geneva Convention uh, as far as we could. Uh -huh. That, I think you probably know well, was one of our key factors is to get information, all we had to do was say, well, you see, now you're a prisoner of war, we're going to report this to the International Red Cross and they will let Japan know, oh no, don't do that! Uh, what do you need to know? <laughs> Just don't let them know in Japan, prisoner, because my family will be disgraced. And uh, So this was a real piece of leverage that we had with, with prisoners. How about the other way around, though? 
I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, on the canal, you know, the, what's going on? The ordinary Marine's got to be pretty angry at anybody oh. looking Japanese. Yeah, Did you I, have any problems with uh, well, I having to keep guys from really going after him or doing something they shouldn't Well, we been? realized, our group uh, in the language bracket, realized very soon that the Marine senior personnel had made the right decision in not incorporating any Japanese Americans with the Marine Corps. Uh, once in the field, Jesus, that would have been, it would have been, uh, protecting those people would have been very difficult. Just mistaken identity, if you want it. Uh, when, this is jumping a bit, but when I was working with the Army on the war crimes trials, we had, I had a team of Nisei instructors. We had to protect those people from the Philippines. Jesus, the Filipinos, you let them out loose at night, uh, they were gone. Mm -hmm. yeah. So <laughs> it, 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 it was difficult. Yeah. Yeah. How about when you got to New Zealand? Uh, did, you know, you got the prisoners, was, was there did any evidence of, you know, the ordinary New Zealanders' hostility not, to the Japanese or anything like that? Not Japanese? a great deal because Essentially, New Zealand, the bulk of New Zealand forces were in the Middle East. So, as far as they were concerned, that was their war. And uh, they had some small units up in New Guinea with the Aussies and that sort of thing. But, and, and the, of course, the Coast Watchers. And uh, so, it, it wasn't quite as personal a thing as Pearl Harbor had made the U.S. Uh, uh, sure, New Zealanders then and still today feel that uh, we had saved them from Japanese occupation by stopping them in the Solomons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Uh, go, to move on to New Zealand, you, you mentioned you went up to the what was the Featherstone camp. I think I'm right. I understand that there. That's one of the places, wasn't there? A riot or something by the Japanese prisoners? Not when you guys were there. But I think a little earlier, where they had uh, they had a clash with the, the well, British they, or the or the New Zealand guards or something. I I don't know, but I, I do know they they had a very limited language capacity until the U.S. people got there, and this this is where John Pelzel worked with Jack Colley, who was the G2 of the division okay. and got permission to pull the people out of the regiments and take us all up there. And we spent all day in that camp working with the prisoners, basically letting the New Zealanders know what, what these people were happening, what the law was, and then letting the prisoners know you better toe the line because these people won't mess around. And they were reasonably well fed, and not a, what, exactly what they wanted, but it, they were getting plenty of good food. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were allowed to do things like uh, uh, put on little Japanese theatrical activities and sort of cultural activities. And, and the, this exposed the camp personnel to, oh, well, these people are somewhat human. <laughs> right. Okay. But your function then sounds like this is not an ongoing interrogation situation. This is more of a we didn't, management. There really team. wasn't a lot to learn from them. As a matter of fact, later, during the period we were in New Zealand, Elmer and I and Bill Croyle were picked up and sent up to uh, First Fib Corps in Noumea mm -hmm. to work on documents that were coming down from the Solomons. Not just Guadalcanal, but yep. New Georgia and mm -hmm. up that way, the Russell Islands. And we did some limited interrogations, although most of the prisoners were pretty well outside of, New Z of Noumea. So we worked with 1st Fib Corps G2. Mm -hmm. and uh, Was there much problem of, or issue of trying to se segregate out the people who were ethnically Korean from the Japanese? Or were there many Koreans at that point that, that we had? There, to the best of my knowledge, there were no. The first, my, my first exposure to to Koreans was at Tarawa. Okay, so it's it's later that that they're more of a factor. Well, they they were complete labor battalion 
there are hundreds of them. And basically, <laughs> they were most of the survivors. The Japanese right. uh, killed themselves. Right, at, at the end of the yeah. Ottawa. Yeah, yeah when you okay. get into a, a bunker or something, it's just bodies with rifles up to their chin, you know. Yeah. Before we get to that, back, just back to Numia for a minute. Numia, you were with the first amphibious corps. Yeah, which course. was the overall Marine command for that Pacific area for down there. For the whole there. southwest Pacific Under FMEF pack in Honolulu. Right. Okay. And you would have been on the division staff there, At right? the Corps. I was at the, the Corps staff. The Corps staff Corps there. Staff. Okay. Even even higher. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And do you have any idea, re recollection, how many, you know, how many Japanese language officers would they have had there at that point? Were you working with uh, They had Johnny Tiger Erskine. Did, did you ever run into Erskine? I know the name, yeah. Right. Uh, Johnny had been with the Raiders. He went into uh, Tulagi with the Raiders. And uh, he was another a BIJ type. He was quite fluent. And uh, I never met him on the canal. He, he, is, he was with a different, I guess with 1st Division headquarters, and I didn't see him that much. So this was the first time that I, he, too, had been moved from the 1st Division up to the core level to help out. And uh, I got along, we got along very well. I, I, I enjoyed working with him. How do you, what, what's the title? He went into CIA after the war. We did. Yeah, okay. I, I, I run into him again in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, he couldn't tell me much about what he was doing, but. <laughs> <laughs> How's he get this name Tiger? Was he a tough guy or a little? A little guy? teeny squirt. <laughs> He'd never have gotten a commission without his language background. He wasn't tall enough or heavy enough. Or <laughs> so he was kind of a spoof, like yeah. you know, a tiny little, little guy, a Tiger. <laughs> Uh, but he was uh, he was a real hard charger. He was good. Okay, and, and at that point you're in Numia. It's sort of what what was your actual sort of work? Were you well, we're, we're going to document? We change. lived out at a camp at Ansvada, which was a beautiful beach area on the uh, sort of a uh, big inlet off east of, of Numia, and we would just commute into the. When they, would, they had work they wanted to do, so they do there, we'd just commute into the Corps headquarters, which was in the city. Were and there any Navy Japanese language officers at that Corps headquarters, or was it all Marines? I never saw any Navy. Okay. Uh, the, it, see, it was a Marine command, uh, mm -hmm. and, and uh, actually they had an unfortunate accident. That, Commanding general was a three-star. I think there'd been a party, but anyway, he fell off a balcony, <laughs> one of those French balconies in Numea, and was killed. Him. Uh, general Barrett, and uh, he. And then I forget who replaced him at that point. Mm -hmm. But then Elmer and I and Croyle, Croyle got, while we were there in Noumea, his, the malaria that he got on the canal caught up with him and it moved into blackwater fever and uh, I thought for 10 days there he was dead. And uh, a Navy nurse really just dedicated herself to keeping this guy alive. You and mentioned that, something I'd seen at Boulder. I wanted to ask you about that. That early in the war, there are lots of Navy nurses on, on they had in, a, in New Caledonia. A Navy mobile hospital in uh, on New Caledonia. Okay. And uh, it, it was staff normal Navy hospital staffing of nurses and doctors. And, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, fortunately for Bill, I think he was better there than if he'd been in New Zealand because these people knew what the score was, and uh, uh, he was taken care of, but. He was much weakened, and they decided they'd evacuate him, and they sent him back to the Seattle area, which was his home, for more treatment. Mm -hmm. I think he How went about, to Bainbridge. This is sort of a sidetrack, but it's an interesting point. Most people think of, well, you know, the Marines go off for the whole war, and uh, in New Caledonia, there's Navy nurses. Is there any kind of social life? You know, time uh, for yes, parties Yes, I was things? dating a very nice nurse there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, that must have been nice. <laughs> Tropical island, beautiful beach. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was, it doesn't sound like at this point you guys are working. This was, this was better duty than New Zealand. <laughs> so you're not working, you know, 24, no, 25 no, hours a day. No, there was, you know, a lot of beach volleyball and that sort of stuff. Just keep in shape. Okay. And then the three, two of us, Elmer and I, were picked up and sent back to New Zealand. And at that point, we were on the lure lane again. Our, our regiment had gone from San Diego to, to Samoa on the three Matson liners. Mm -hmm. Real tough duty on there. Yeah. <laughs> Two second lieutenants in a B-deck stateroom with a lanai. Oh, it's nice. <laughs> but uh, the lure line by that time had been fully converted, and boy, it was stacked, and it was taking troops to Australia. So we went from Numea to Melbourne, and then we were supposed to go over to back to Wellington, and there were Japanese subs operating in the Tasman Sea, so we went south and down around the southern end of New Zealand and back up the east coast. And I mean, God, it was, it was, this was midwinter, and it was colder than hell. Oh, man. Elmer was thrown out of his bunk and broke his arm. <laughs> yeah, they, they, what the Aussies call the Southern Ocean has yeah, oh, big man. swells. Yeah, and those that's waves are just coming right out of Antarctica. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. what, what were you going to do this time when you're back in New Zealand? What was what well? Was was the at that point, we rejoined our units and we were training people. For, we didn't know what the next operation was going to be at that level, but the word was get people ready for another operation and be sure that they understand. You know, that John. Pelzel was working closely with all of us and be sure that they know what kind of documents to look for. Tell them, for Christ's sake, try and get a prisoner. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, but the, the sort of things like uh, postal savings books which had their name and rank and all that information and uh, their government insurance policies and that they, all they carried all this documentary. You know how the Japanese are. They had to stuff their pockets with stuff. And your your job was to convince or tell the ordinary Marines that to what this to is look the kind for, of thing to look for. What to look for, and uh, off of a dead body or try and get a live one. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, at Tarawa, as it turned out, we didn't get many live ones. But uh, that really, I don't feel, was the fall of the combat people because I know both Elmer and I were called up after they cleared an area and you knew damn well there were bunkers in there with people in them and they we'd be called up there to go down there and try to get these people to surrender or do something and it just all you got was the dead. Just to go back a little bit, you, you had a kind of a long stretch between the canal and then wow, terror. Yeah. How did you feel, I mean, you'd been on the canal, so you knew something. How did you feel, you know, going into terror? What? Oh, I think everybody was ready. We got, they, they tried, and this was uh, a lack of real experience, both medical and tactical, to send everybody, who, the malaria patients, out of the South Pacific. Well, they suddenly realized, if we keep this up, there isn't going to be any division. So they said, no, the, you medical people are going to have to analyze these people and keep the, most of them, particularly the, the senior NCOs and who, who run the joint. And then we started getting large-scale reinforcements coming in from the states. Uh, not total units, but just bodies. And these people were just incorporated in, in as replacements into the units and uh, at that point that's when Sheiks came and joined mm -hmm. John in, in division headquarters so they now had two officers at division and then our Samoan group down in the regiment and, and boardman and the six Marines had picked up somewhere along the way maybe in San Diego after they got back from Iceland John Zimmerman can you tell us about him? Well, he was, I, I really don't know what his full background was. He was a, a, an academic and a historian and actually after World War II wound up in the historical division at Headquarters Marine Corps. 
and I saw him there when I was stationed at headquarters. I'd see John fairly often there. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever happened to him finally? But I, he he also knew Japanese. He was a yeah. Oh yeah. He, his, he wasn't terribly fluent, but he he had enough to handle documents and prisoners on a basic level. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but anyway, you're gonna go, you're gonna go into Tarawa. Were you? I don't know, disappointed that there wasn't, given the way the fighting went, that there wasn't more opportunity to get prisoners? Well, I, the hell, I, that was our job, <laughs> but uh, uh, I wasn't going to tell the troops that uh, you, you got to go in that bunker and get somebody out because they knew what they were doing and they knew what was coming out of it, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> mostly how, fire. <laughs> how, how did you go about that? Later on, I know they had you know people with loudspeakers and things like that. But at Tarawa, it was just literally it go up there and shout. E explosives and 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 uh, napalm, and when the thing when the troops decided that the place was not reacting, then th somebody would say, "Well, get those interpreters up here and see if there's anybody coming out." Mm -hmm. But they weren't very eager to go in there and try and grab somebody. Hardly. They, Hardly. They prefer it that we call somebody out. <laughs> but uh, neither one worked too well in that particular case. Uh, no. Right? no. But uh, Elmer and I, we wound up. There was something in your in your notes about the people on the headquarters people at Bougainville being unhappy about having to drag all these Japanese dictionaries around. Well, we both. We had, when we were in New Mayo, we had some nice cabinet makers there, and they made us wooden dictionary boxes, hmm. not that big, a little bigger than a briefcase. And we, we each went ashore with a, with a box of dictionaries on top of our helmet and your carbine over here, <laughs> uh, and, and ducking. Because, <laughs> Jesus, uh, there was, this was uh, the morning of D+. Plus. We spent the night just circling around because there was no room on the beach. I mean, the, the, the front literally was about the depth of this room and then there was a seawall and everybody was behind the seawall. And they, they just sent radio back out, don't send anybody in yet, there's no room. Mm -hmm. So the next morning uh, we got in as far as the reef, we were in boats so we couldn't uh, go over the reef. And so you got out on, on a reef and then you jump off the reef and it's up to about here. And you're just walking in, trying to keep close to that long pier that ran out from the, because that gave you some protection from at least one flank. Mm -hmm. But geez, you could just see the <laughs> shrapnel and stuff hitting the water out there. It was, it was not did, uh, I don't ask you this, did, did they have a set I don't know what the exact technical word, but a set sort of design as to okay, where the headquarters unit, where the intelligence section, where the you know language section goes in a in the the sequence of the invasion. Yeah, obviously we, you weren't the very first way, but they did they have a well the battalion guys Elmer and those went in with their battalions, which landed uh, the three battalions of the Eighth Marines landed abreast, no two abreast and one in reserve on D-Day and uh, I was with regimental headquarters and they said there you can't get in there so the colonel just told us the uh, skipper of this landing craft well just keep going around <laughs> and we did mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, went to when it got daylight and we could see the situation and we were getting some radio contact with with division what the guys on the beach were radioing out to division headquarters, which was on the Maryland the battleship, mm -hmm. and then division would send it back to our regiment of what the hell was going on. And they finally they said, "Okay, the word is you can go ashore now on this beach." Do Do you know? Okay, we're we're. Can I say something? Sure. Then well, away. we. Again, Elmer and I wound up with uh, the job of uh, escorting the prisoners back to Pearl. And uh, they were dropped off and then we went from there over to the Big Island. 
and the whole division was put up on the Parker Ranch at, at a, what was <laughs> called Camp Tarawa. And this is December, intense. And we'd been two years in the tropics, and I mean, it was cold. Jesus, it was just murder. <laughs> but fortunately, we again, they said, well, we need people to go over and scan the documents that are coming from Tarawa. Because by this time, they'd gotten engineers in there and collected all this stuff. It was coming back by the boatload. And the main thing was that they wanted to find out the structure of these units that the Japanese were putting on these islands. And uh, we were pretty familiar with that aspect of it, so they, we were flown back over to Pearl, and Elmer and I were put into an apartment uh, at Pearl Harbor, and we worked out of Jikpoa. Oh, you did work at Jikpoa? Though. Yeah. Did Bob Sheeks go with you at that point, or was Bob still? No, I think he, John kept him with the division. He needed more military <laughs> than, than he needed that kind of thing. And uh, so, so John, John Pelzel was kind of a well, he, honcho. <laughs> yeah, he, he was the division Japanese language officer. Gotcha. He was, I don't know, a couple of months senior to me. <laughs> <laughs> so he would have been like a captain or something. Then. Yeah, he was. I don't think John had made major then. But he, he was still a captain. Guys anyway. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there may have been some bolder people joined the division on Hawaii. Uh, but Elmer and I, the only thing was, the uh, we had been overseas for a little better than two years at that point. And they said, well, we're sending you guys back and we were going to go to the school at Elliott and help out there because that thing, as you indicated in your material, is coming unglued. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is about January of, uh, of 44. We went back there, and uh, Elmer took off and got married. Uh, and I was at the school. I was working with this guy, Freddie Wolf, for a while. And a fellow by the name of Jew Jewett, I think his name was, uh, there. I think he was a captain also. It was Jim Jewett. And, but it, was, it really wasn't functioning too well. But, one of my students was a guy you referred to, Dunbar. And of course, he hadn't yet been out to the Pacific, and he was just pumping me all the time. What, how would you do this? What did you say to that? <laughs> Real <laughs> gung ho. Uh, uh, but that lasted, I'd say, about two months, and then I got assigned to the Army Combat Intelligence School at Camp Ritchie. Which is now back in Maryland. Which is now became Shangri La, and then is now Camp. What do they call it? Camp David. Oh, okay. And this was the Army. The Army Counterintelligence School was in Fort Holabird in Maryland, and this was the Combat Intelligence Center up at in, in the mountains. And I was sent there to get more. Uh, senior level intelligence training of all the order of battle and communications and all of that stuff. And while there, uh, I was directed by headquarters Marine Corps to come down and have an interview with Heinmarsh. And so apparently my name had already been referred from the division, probably by John, to headquarters Marine Corps to see if you can get these people additional training. Because, let's face it, at that time, after the operations we'd been through, we figured this was going to be a long war. <laughs> and uh, so we, uh, I went back up and finished the Army school, and at that point my orders came from headquarters, Marine Corps, you can go back out to California and leave to your home and then report to Boulder. Mm -hmm. And Elmer got the set, same set of orders. Okay, and I think you told me, or maybe it was somewhere else, that um, Bill Croyle also got orders with you guys to go to No, he was still 
on kind of limited duty. Um, and he didn't show up there until probably about April. Well, he got married in Boulder on St. Patrick's Day. Okay. Of 44. Uh, of, no, yeah. no. Would have been 44 when you were there, right? Yeah. No, but we didn't. We didn't start there until till summer. So summer was, of forty. He didn't come in until the spring of the next year. Uh, he finished Boulder after the war was over. I see. So he's really at the tail end of it. Yeah. He wasn't there with you. So when well, he was there at the same time, but just for maybe. Uh, I was best man at his wedding in Boulder. Okay. <laughs> so you remember that? So it's yeah. St. Patrick's Day forty-five. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And because we left there, Elmer and I left there in, I think it was either late July 45 with orders back to FMA Pack. Right. And then by the time we got to San Francisco, uh, they had dropped a bomb. And so Elmer's orders were, he was a reservist. And they said, you've got too many points to go back overseas. And he was mad, he wanted to go. But, uh, and I was a regular, so they said, you get on the plane and <laughs> keep going. <laughs> just, just a little bit about Boulder. When you, when you were at Boulder, I said, you had, you had a small class that was just Elmer and you, and who was the third? Ted Weinbrenner, a Navy Ted. guy who had been, went to USC, okay. uh, left college and went out to Shanghai and worked with the Shanghai Evening News and when the war broke out was interned and in POW or internment camp learned a fair amount of Japanese. He, he was a smart cookie and he arrived I think in Boulder as a seaman second and they made him an ensign and they said okay you three guys have had prior experience you're a class. Okay. And How about the other attitude of the other people towards you? I mean you, you got a you know, you got real combat experience being between Taro and Guadalcanal. Were the other, you know, language students curious and asking you questions about it? Yeah, there was only one other guy. There was a naval officer, who naval reserve officer, who had been in the Philippines when the war started and got out and got to Singapore, and got out of Singapore before that <laughs> fell, and wound up in Indonesia, and finally got down to uh, Australia and was made the port director of Brisbane <laughs> for the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> and But because he had, he spoke Malay, he was sent to Boulder and was in the Malay ah, course. Malay and he's, thing. as far as I know, the only other, other than the British officers. Yeah, well, who by, had to, by yeah. the way their system worked, they had to have had active duty service first yeah. before they did that. But were the other students, did they, you know, they, were they curious and asking oh, about yeah, your Oh, yeah, so were the instructors. I mean, the instructors had essentially no military vocabulary. I mean, you talked about a tochka. They didn't know what the hell that was and stuff like that. So you were half, half instructor and half student, it sounds well, like. Well, the thing was, I was senior to the director of the school, of the language, the Japanese language school. He was a two-striper, and I, I had made major. <laughs> so I was the senior Marine on board and I was responsible for all the Marines that were assigned there. Mm -hmm. So you had that kind of administrative responsibility besides, yeah. at, at this point, going back to studying Japanese, was that hard or easy for you? Well, uh, we had gotten a good background and we knew what the hell we were going to do with it when we got out there. So the three of us really, it was every week was just a knock down drag out competition to see who could do the best on the Saturday exam. Mm -hmm. And I figured out somewhere we were, all three of us were over a 95 percent. Uh, wow. We really worked. Do you remember any of the sensei that you worked with? Uh, Ashikaga sensei or Nakamura? Uh, Ashikaga was the, Elmer and I really got to know him well. Nakamura-san, who was handled the book two early stuff. We'd already had book one, so he took book two. And uh, Hoshino-san. Hoshino? Hoshino. Hoshino. Hoshino yeah. And, uh, but, and, and the, I can't remember his name, the guy from uh, the University of Washington. Oh, Tatsumi. Tatsumi, Tatsumi. yeah, Tatsumi. Henry Tatsumi, yeah. yeah. 
uh, he was one of our instructors, but Oshkaga was the main one because he would like to go out and have a martini with us. Uh, so you could really talk Japanese yeah, over and over really the floor. <laughs> That's the way to do it. Uh, Pillow talk and bar talk. <laughs> I should mention, uh, it probably shouldn't get in print, but we got one Marine there. I don't know if you ever heard the name Jethro Robinson. And Elmer and I both looked at each other when this guy walked in and we said, somebody commissioned this guy? I mean, he was way too short. He was wearing Coke bottle bottom glasses. His uniform was a total shambles. As a matter of fact, he got picked up in Denver for impersonating an officer. So <laughs> <laughs> that solved the problem? <laughs> I, th I think he did survive the course. He, he stayed on after we left there, but <laughs> we, there were some of these guys were pretty dubious uh, quality for what we knew they were going to get into. That's interesting. By the time you got to Boulder, it's, it's well, the war is well along. Fair well, the, the, the second division is now uh, on yeah, Saipan and Right, Canadian. right. So, would you say that the you know the quality of people that you were with back in Samoa even was higher than the kind of people that you saw around you? At well, academically later? they weren't. Not academically, no. But uh, I would say from a dedication standpoint, every one of them, Bill Croyle worked like hell. Uh, all of them worked very hard, and uh, as far as I was concerned, my Although I was really only sort of the administrative officer, uh, I was keeping track of these people, and if, if there were problems, I was on their case. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I knew where the, what, what they were going to be in trouble once they left Boulder. Sure, you knew what they were going to go to. Did you have any responsibility for you know, trying to essentially recruit from the larger pool of students at Boulder? Well, guys, you can be Navy, you can be Marines. No, or that how about was, the Marines? Oh, you mean the... the the people that were in the classes? Yeah, the regular. Uh, well, most of them I got to know pretty well. Uh, my roommate at, in the men's, women's dorm we were in. God, I, I, I've seen your moments. I can't even remember his name now. <laughs> the guy we, we, his wife was the pilot, uh, a stewardess with Pan Am and yeah, he he's at uh, was uh, at uh, at, uh, at not Georgetown, the other big. I think he met the people in the regular classes, didn't you? Yeah. You're thinking of people within your group. No, he he was in the regular class, months okay. behind me. He was a naval officer, but right. they just said, okay, you're in here. You've got a roommate. Hit that's that's that. Uh, he was a Rhodes Scholar, a sharp guy, and uh, he and I and Bill Croyle were very close friends. Mm -hmm. He was in a class with Bill Croyle, and uh, well, anyway, to get to your question, it, I, I enjoyed the comradeship with with these people. They were appreciably younger. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we, we, there was the athletic activities and volleyball and baseball and whatever going on. And uh, the Marines, Elmer and I just conducted some basic uh, <laughs> infantry drill and that sort of stuff. And, and we'd have a meeting and talk with them about what we had been doing on active duty with one of the divisions so that they had a better what, idea what was mm -hmm. happening. But you, again, You've been out there, you've been through this, but the war's still in going. When you were at Boulder, did you feel like you really wanted to get back out there and you know, be in the next, next assault, next battle, whatever? Both Elmer and I had requested, put a request in, in writing to Headquarters Marine Corps to be reassigned to the 2nd Marine Division. Because you would have missed out, in a sense, missed out, if that's, that's not exactly a good word, but you, were, you weren't with well, them in the marsh. You were in, in, in Boulder. We knew the unit. and. Of course, there'd been some turnover in people, but that was our outfit. It's my outfit today. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, in 1956, I went back to 
Camp Lejeune and took command of the 1st Battalion, 8th Marines, the first outfit I'd ever joined. How about that? That was really, really a highlight. <laughs> that must have been a really stirring moment. I yeah, mean, I had that, that battalion for a year, and it was great duty. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, to move ahead, because I we don't want to be too long, you get the job of going to the Philippines, right? Yes. And I was very unhappy about that. I, I went... With the to, Army, yeah, I mean. <laughs> yeah, I went to the assistant G1, who was a classmate of mine, and said, what the hell goes on? I was told I would be sent back to Second Division. He says, sorry about that, you're going to the Army. So I put him on my list right then. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I flew out to Manila and joined Addis. And uh, it, it was obvious that the war was winding down by this point. There hadn't been an official surrender, but uh, yeah. a bomb had been dropped, or two of them by that time, I guess. And uh, everybody was kind of standing by to stand by. Mm -hmm. And uh, So you would have been in Manila the, when the war, the news that the war is actually over. I was there came. at the time of the surrender. What? What happened then? I mean, what did people do? You remember that? We we're talking about well, Pearl Harbor Day. You remember that I was, day? <laughs> well, I, I I was the attached to a Marine detachment that was in Manila, and but working on the staff of Addis, and uh, then it was decided that once the surrender was completed, we Addis would move as a unit to Tokyo. So we just packed our bags and wound up on September 4th, the day after the surrender at Atsugi. Wow. And uh, took a train from, I guess it was Yokosuka, up into Tokyo. And I Were you excited about actually going to Japan finally? Oh, after yeah. And, uh, but the devastation was, uh, God, that, was, that area from uh, north of, of Yokosuka all the way through Yokohama and, and uh, on up through that industrial area in there. It was just a desert. Mm. The, the only activity you saw, the, the, the house tiles were from the roofs were just in stacks on what was somebody's property. That was all that was left. And a little vegetable garden. That was, that was it. Mm. And these people were coming back in from somewhere and sort of protecting their property and, and I guess trying to get started over again. We got into Tokyo and the area around the palace at the Maranouchi was in pretty good shape except for the uh, Tokyo station had just been leveled and it was being rebuilt. But MacArthur was there in, in the insurance building, Meiji yeah, the building. Yeah. And, uh, uh, we went into the NYK building, which was right on the corner across mm -hmm. from, the from the station. There, right? Yeah. Well, we were did in, you live there or just work? Yeah, there? we were. We were put up in what had been the occupation Philippine embassy, and the army just took that over, and it was uh, officers' quarters. Mm -hmm. uh, Elmer had had to was put on hold back on the west coast. And it was at this point that nobody really knew what the post-war structure of the Marine Corps was going to be. And he waited and waited and waited and finally said, to hell with it. And he was married by that point. He married while we were still at Boulder. And you were single all this time. I right? was single. Still single. So he uh, went to Berkeley and lived at I House there and, and got his degree and then went to law school at SC. Mm -hmm. and Still a lawyer, <laughs> right? Sure, but he got recalled for Korea. He got recalled for Korea. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but you going back to when you were first in Japan here, you, at that point, I mean that's awful close to the very end of it. You, you guys weren't. You didn't have a jeep at your disposal, so it was kind of you couldn't go around freely, or or. Oh, uh, yeah, I, we could move around pretty well. Uh, <laughs> I do remember being there with Bill Wood, who was also an intelligence, Marine intelligence officer out there, and we were in a jeep going somewhere <laughs> around the palace, and this guy was had one of those, what was that little uh, three-wheeler taxi type thing, and was just going like this, and he stopped at a traffic light, and Bill just 
reached over and pulled the keys out and threw them in the moat. And he said, you ain't driving us anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't trust him, huh? Nope. <laughs> At that point, did you have any chance to talk with or have any contact with just ordinary Japanese people? Or you guys are so busy or well, so Well, there sort of we were, it was pretty much just, you. well, after you could go to a restaurant or something like that, but you went to your quarters and you came back and it was a, John Palzell was there and had been assigned to the US bus, the, the bomb survey. Yep. And uh, I was still there as part of Addis. And a, what happened was that, uh, aside from John, uh, the, the uh, reserve officers were being sent home. And there were, I was the only regular So you were a Marine officer. regular all this yeah, time. Yeah, I, I got a regular commission on Guadalcanal uh, and uh, as an infantry officer. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, how did that work? Did they just ask you, do you want to go regular? Or, oh, you know, you've really been doing well. The regimental you commander recommends you for it and, and, if you, and sends it in. And I talked to some of mine who'd been Naval Academy graduates and were senior to me, and they said, well, I'll tell you what you need to do, Harry. He says, if you refuse that, you'll make the old man mad. And in the second place, if you're a regular officer and this war ever ends, you can say, I resign my commission and walk out the door. If you reserve, you'll stay till they let you go. <laughs> and he was, you had was a real right. incentive there to do that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I, I took it, and he said, and you'll get better jobs. And uh, that was true, too. Yeah, of course, of course. So how long were you in Tokyo? When, when uh, I just about, I got there in September. And in late October, the word came in, that they wanted this officer to be chief interpreter for these war crimes trials. And I was the guy that was left the, the reservists, all these hotshot BIJs and whatever, and the, the Navy types, they'd all gone home. So he said, Pratt, you're it, back on the plane. So I got down to Manila and reported into the commanding general of this uh, International War Crimes Commission, and uh, how'd you feel about that? that time? Well, once again, uh, <laughs> I'm a regular. <laughs> you get your orders. That's what you do. It sounded interesting, and I had met Yamashita, uh, Sam Stratton. Did you ever catch yeah, up? Yeah, he was with a Sam? later a congressman. I think yes, that's yeah. right. Well, Sam was a little junior to me at Boulder, uh, but he was graduated in an earlier class. And the two of us were assigned to Addis. And as Boulder types, we just sort of got together. And so one day we heard that, that Yamashita and his chief of staff, Muto, were in this uh, Bilabad uh, prison. So we said, well, what the hell? We'll just go out there and see what's going on. So we went out and inter introduced ourselves to the CO and said, look, we're interpreters from MacArthur's headquarters. That sort of turned things open. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, we just like to talk with these gentlemen for a short while. Okay, go right ahead. So we went in and spent about two hours, I guess, with uh, Yamashita and Muto just talking about their various operations, uh, the Singapore thing for particularly. I hadn't realized that he had been a fairly senior officer in China at Nanking, which was not good news for him. Uh, and uh, Muto was a very smart, really sharp cookie. And actually, in the, in the trial itself, of uh, Yamashita's trial, he was one of the key witnesses. And I'll never forget this guy. I, I was doing the interrogation. and. Uh, the prosecution attorney, the army officer, said, you understand English, don't you? And Muto looked at him for a minute. He said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Brought down the house. All the, all the correspondents were there just roaring. <laughs> Did you get a chance? 
Well, you actually started in this job of being the, you know, the interpreter in the trial to uh, <coughs> consult with the, you know, the, the attorneys about the kind of questions they're going to ask. So you'd have, I mean, the military vocabulary wouldn't have been any problem for you, but the, the, the legalese or that kind of stuff? Uh, well, uh, I think I've made some notes on that, but I had a team of Nisei interpreters, Army. Some officers, some enlisted. Uh, as I said in my notes, they were quite competent in Kiowa, but they, very few of them had had real combat experience, and they were going to be talking to four-star generals, three-star generals. Mm -hmm. They didn't really have what we got at Boulder, the upper level of polite Japanese that you would use in, mm -hmm. in uh, speaking, you know, kakawa, <laughs> that yeah, sort yeah, of thing. Yeah. Uh, so when we were working directly with those people on a sticky subject, I, I moved. Otherwise, I left the interpretation to the Nisei boys and just made sure that as I heard it, it was, there weren't any serious errors. Of course, Yamashita had his own personal interpreter with him, a Harvard graduate. So uh, he ha knew exactly what was happening. Yeah. yeah, he was well taken care of. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, that's interesting. I can't remember. I think the fellow's name was Hamada. I've forgotten now. Okay. All right. Uh, so how long did those trials run? How long well, Homus was the first. Yeah. And I felt. I had no sympathy for him. His staff officers were up and down that line of march in Batani. They knew exactly what was going on. There was no excuse for the treatment those prisoners got. And uh, yeah. he, he was shot. Uh, Yamashita, I, I got to know the defense counsel, very good, uh, real, Frank Real. Got to know him. He was the, actually was a colonel. Army colonel was the chief defense officer, but this guy was an army captain, very sharp. In fact, he was the guy who took the Yamashita case before the Supreme Court, and uh, he wrote a book. And Frank and I both, we discussed this, maybe we weren't supposed to, but we did, uh, about the fact that Yamashita's situation was not that different from MacArthur's when he got in trouble. Manila was not defensible if you didn't control the sea. And that was happening. The Japanese Navy was sitting out there and MacArthur was screwed. Nothing he could do. So he pulled out. And Yamashita did the same thing. He, he picked his troops. When he saw that uh, things were really going bad, from bad to worse, pulled his troops out and went up toward uh, Baguio yeah, in the, north. In, in the yeah. mountains. Pulled it out in good order, got his troops out of there before the uh, Air Force came in and blew all the bridges. <laughs> and uh, so he, at the time of the surrender, was up there as an integral force. And But he was held responsible for what happened in the city of Manila, which was pop populated with uh, deserters, refugees from sunken ships, mm -hmm. a whole bunch of warehouse people. And the senior officers had all committed suicide, so it was just a shambles. And and uh, the Japanese that were in there simply took the attitude, "We're going, you're going with us." And they round up these Filipinos and just yeah. kill them. Yeah. So, okay. but Yamashita's up in the mountains. He's in radio contact with Manila. Well, if you're in radio contact, you're not asking how's the civilian populations getting along. You know, you're trying to say, <laughs> is there any food left down there? What the hell's going? <laughs> mm -hmm. So we felt in Manila that that Yamashita got railroaded, and of course MacArthur's uh, convening authorities' decision on the trial came down on December seventh. Uh, we felt that might have been a clue. <laughs> right, it was the which way it was going to go. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. Uh, it was it was that Yamashita defeated him at, at originally, and he was going to get back, take care of that. Yeah, yeah. When when did you leave to go up to Sasebo? 
you were, you were there for oh, the trials Oh, I, I stayed for, a while. for the, those two trials, and so it was, it was after Christmas. I think it was probably about January I flew up to, back to Tokyo. I, well, I finally I, I sent a telex to FMF Pack and said, hey, fellas, I'm in the Marine Corps. How's to get me the hell out of here and back to the <laughs> Marines? And so they just sent down a set of orders detaching me from this outfit. By that time, I was the senior Marine in Manila, so I had to disband myself. <laughs> and right out along, you know, daily order, <laughs> disbanding myself and sending it to headquarters Marine Corps. And then I just got first transportation up to Tokyo and checked out of Tokyo and then took the train down to Sasebo. This was probably late January. Right. And joined the Second Marine Division and was assigned as assistant G1 of the division because they said, look, uh, you spent most of the war in combat intelligence. We want you to get into a, some different yeah. paperwork. If you're going to stay in the Marines, you need to know about yeah. this other kind of stuff. So then in that job, you would have been back down in, in Sasebo for a while. With, I was there until the, we picked up and took the division back to Lejeune. To, okay, until it left in, later in the August year. of, of, of 46. 46. Yeah, okay. In that job, did you have any chance or opportunity to get out and around? Well, and, oh, in Sasebo, I, you know, we could go out and, and talk to people and go, but uh, basically it wasn't my job and I, the intelligence people felt this was sort of their they're Turkey, and we don't want people potentially going in and telling something different than we're putting out. So yeah. I, I didn't do too much of that. And the guys that would have been, at, for example, at the at the even at the divisional level, would have been pretty junior to you by that time, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I, by that time, yeah, I was a. I'd been a major for a year and a half. Yeah. Yeah. So you wouldn't have been down at that level anyway. No. And there wouldn't have been people that you would have the people you were with at Boulder were were. You know, there places. may have been some bolder lieutenants down yeah, in the unit somewhere, but uh, it wasn't would have been. my business to get with them. And, and uh, uh, I actually had Marine Corps classmates from, from Quantico from 1941 who were scattered around the division, and those were the people that I was oh, seeing. Okay. And, yeah, you got to see them. Did you feel at that point that, hey, I'm going to need this Japanese language skill that I got, or wait a minute, the war's over, this is past, it's time to move on to something else? Oh no, I, I, I stayed up with it and uh, uh, when we got down to Lejeune, I at that point had a home leave a month. This is after Sasebo now? <laughs> yeah, and I, I got married to my first wife in, in, uh, in Los Angeles, actually at the chapel over here at UCLA. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> A nice Episcopal chapel there, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> then went back to Lejeune as uh, once back in the infantry business, uh, but at staff level. I s did serve as a C2 there for a short time, and uh, simply because the the job was open, so I stayed in touch with the Japanese, and then was ordered up to the junior school at, at uh, Quantico. Okay and went through that school, which was at that point was about a six month school, and stayed on the staff as an instructor in combat intelligence. And there again, I was in touch with the Japanese embassy in Washington and knew these people pretty well. And okay, by that time. Yeah. What about when Korea came along? Where, where were I you? I was in Quantico. You were in Quantico in school or? or uh, no, I was an instructor. You were an instructor by that and time. Of course, at that point, every instructor was at work a night and day as we brought all the reservists back in because they activated the entire Marine Corps Reserve, everybody. Mm -hmm. And Elmer, that's when Elmer and Croyle got <laughs> back in. Pulled back in, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you were doing that type of work during, during at least the first was, year or so? I was training through. people in combat intelligence as they came back into the system. Right. Okay. And from there, I was put up moved up to headquarters Marine Corps and put into the G2 division of headquarters and was liaison officer to uh, Army Map Service, Aeronautical Chart Service, the Hydrographic Office, and Photo Intelligence.
because uh -huh. that, that all falls into the intelligence field. I've heard various stories about this, and maybe you'd know. Some people have said that when we went into Korea, you know, we really had to rely on the Japanese charts, maps, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Where you, did you oh, really? I would guess yes, because, well, first of all... It had been part of Japan. Yeah, yeah, but by that time, the Japanese were our allies, and you could just <laughs> go to the there are those offices and say, hey, we want all those charts you've <laughs> prepared on Korea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then from that section where I work coordinating intelligence activities throughout the Marine Corps, uh, I was, the occupation was over and they reopened the embassy and they said, we've got to have a, a naval attaché. So I went out as the assistant naval attaché under a Captain Ethelbert Watts, who was oh, yeah. Tokyo graduate. Yeah, one of the pre-war pre -war ones. And well, I hadn't been there more than three months, and he was pretty elderly and not too well, and he just went back to the States for sickness. And I wound up as attaché for two years. Okay. Now and this was would have been after Ham Rolf was there. Ham. Ham was my assistant. Ham was your assistant at that yeah. point. Yeah, oh, and, okay. and a young lieutenant named Lovejoy. He didn't speak any Japanese, but he was just an intelligence yeah, officer. Yeah, but Ham obviously did. Ham did. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah Ham. Ham was very stupid. He'd been in Hong Kong in, in the consulate, consul mm -hmm. general up there, and then moved up to Tokyo. Okay. And so when, when you were there, when you take over from, from Bertie Watts, let's see. Douglas MacArthur the second still would have been the ambassador, right? No. Or is it Reichauer already? No. Oh no. no. No, it was Robert Murphy was. Oh, okay. This this is right after the war. I well, see. it was the day yeah, the occupation yeah. ended. Right after the. I'm this sorry, is the, the ambassador, ended. and MacArthur is now Scap. Yeah. Over in in, in Pershing right. Heights. And then and he's he's gone. He's out of the embassy finally. Yeah, he's gone because Truman he had to turn him. his nice embassy quarters over to the ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he was there, and then uh, he uh, Murphy wasn't there too long. He was pulled back to Washington, and Allison, John Allison, Allison became, became, became yeah, the became ambassador. ambassador. He was a Chinese linguist and had some Japanese. So I got along very well with him. What kind of you know what what would a naval attaché have done that early? I mean, were you guys? Helping build up the, what would become we the were Japanese self defense force? For so our what? Navy, we were keeping ONI abreast of the status of readiness or capability of naval support activities. All the steel mills, the shipyards, what's happened to the various op operational bases. Of course, the Marines were in Sasebo, so they knew what was going on there. But there was Maizuru, there mm -hmm. was, was uh, Ominato up in up the north, you know, yeah. Aomori, yeah. up yep. that area, and uh, uh, Hakodate. So I visited all these bases and actually went to their openings with, with the Kaijo Jietai. And I was very mm -hmm. close friend with, with Nagasaka, Nagasawa Ko, uh, who yeah. was the, uh, the first former IJN head of the Sea Self Defense Force. And I think he'd been an intelligence, Japanese intelligence officer before oh, he was, the war. He was, strict, he was a cruiser man. Oh, he oh, was okay. a hard charger. Oh, we had a lot of talks, that guy. <laughs> uh, and I met all of his various base commanders and his staff and worked very closely with them. Did you ever run anybody into anybody who, you know, had been, would have been on the canal or would have been, there aren't very many Japanese that survived Tarawa, but but you know that would have been in a combat situation where you were in or nearby. Well, I ran into two guys that had been in Featherston and knew me. Really? Right. Walk. Oh, of course, I was in uniform at that point, and uh, they saw me on the street, and they said, "Oh, Captain Pratt." Huh. <laughs> By that time, I think I was a lieutenant colonel. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? And they just came up and started talking to you. Yeah, all oh, and very, very appreciative. They said, you know, you people treated us well, and you gave us the right instructions, and here we are today, and that sort of thing. Oh, it must have made you feel pretty good. Yeah, it was. It was really quite. A, and then, of course, uh, I did meet uh, Admiral Nomura. Uh, he was by that time director of the Peers School in Tokyo, and uh, we 
talk to, uh, I'd meet him socially. I didn't really know him that well, but we'd talk about what he did during the war mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And then it, within the, the Kaijo Jietai, I met a lot of guys who, like you say, were down there in the fighting capacity in the South Pacific. And mm -hmm. I didn't have a lot to do with the Japanese Army, so I, I didn't right. meet too many of those, those people. Guys, like, I did later on in, in commercial activities, I spent a lot of time in Sendai, and the division that we fought on Guadalcanal was the Sendai Division. Sendai division sure. So uh, that produced a lot of interest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would add a, a connection, not necessarily the most ideal one. Yeah. But, yeah. Later on, when, how did you get to be the actual, you eventually became the, the, the senior naval attaché, right? Uh, well, Watts just left the ship. <laughs> okay, and that's the, that, I just moved up one. <laughs> and that, that's the point later on when Reischauer is the ambassador? No, I, I was out there commercially when Reischauer. Oh, I, I knew Haru very well. Uh, Haru Reischauer, Reischauer. Uh, her mother was the first reader in the Christian Science Church in Tokyo, and my wife, first wife, was a Christian scientist. So, mm -hmm. and I was taking the kids to Sunday school there, and Haru was her daughter, and she had Haru and Tani with the two girls that I knew quite well. And I, I met Haru first as an, when she was a correspondent during the occupation. And uh, I forget what paper she was wearing. She was sort of a stringer with several papers, I think, at that point. And Tani was the director of the uh, Jap the, the language, or well, what should I call it? International Language School, which was happened to be right in the area where we were living, uh, in uh, Setagaya, mm -hmm. and uh, I, we know her well. I, I saw her. My kids went to her school, okay, and uh, we later on graduated and went to the American school. Okay, so. Haru, I got to know, and then when Reischauer was, I was back out there commercially, and Reischauer was the ambassador, and I spent, I was invited to the embassy for social functions and mm -hmm. saw the family quite a bit. Uh, Reischauer, of course, was a brilliant guy to be around. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. That's interesting, though. It's sort of informally this connection developed that you, yeah. you got to know. So I was. Our office, I was with Pepsi-Cola Japan hmm. as a regional manager in northern Japan. I was in my office looking out the window immediately adjacent to the embassy and we were looking out the window and another guy and I and we said, geez, something screwy is going on down there. And there were people running around and everything else. Jesus, the next morning it's <laughs> Reichard had been shot. And we didn't realize, well, of course the embassy Put the lid on right away, but uh, that was that was it. And then later on, I saw him at, at the embassy, and he was recovering pretty well. Uh -huh. uh, it's been kind of a shock. Yeah, boy, how the Japanese were lined up at the gate to express their uh, mm -hmm. condolences mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. How did you? I'm going to ask you one other person in the Marine Corps that figures in the story. Did you ever run into Tad Van Brunt? I fired him. You fired him? Yes. Well, we've got to tell me this story about it. We've got to hear this story. <laughs> well, I, I left Pepsi because I would had four and a half years in Canada, and it was a nice job, but I, the Canadian operation didn't need me. Yeah. And I wanted to go back to Japan, and I asked Pepsi International, and they said, well, there's no opening. So I had a good friend from Pepsi who was now with RC. International and I, he put me onto the president there, and, and they took assigned me for vice president of Pacific, uh, based in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. So I went back out to Tokyo in that capacity, and when I arrived there, they said, "Okay, you've got the two guys out there. There's a guy named Spencer in Taiwan, Taipei." And there's a guy in Japan named Van Brunt. And at that point, our Japanese operation was Suntory Whiskey. 
Okay. They were the bottler, or franchisee. Tokyo and Osaka. So I thought, well, yeah, Jesus, I guess I'd, I'd better catch up with this guy. And I went out there as sort of an introductory thing with the president of the company. And he left me in Tokyo and said, okay, you can get your feet on the ground. So I went down to Osaka and uh, I had an address, but it didn't seem to make any, and the phone number didn't seem to work. So I went to Suntory's headquarters and I said, well, well how, uh, this, you, you, of course you know Mr. Vemmer. Well, yeah, we know him. And I said, well, how do I get in touch with him? Well, they gave me a long bit and finally gave me some kind of an address. So I got a cab and gave the guy this address and we wound around. What an attractive residential neighborhood. I went up and knocked on the door and a very attractive Japanese lady at the door and I said, well, I'm here to looking for Mr. Van Brunt. And she said, oh, just a minute. And she got him. He was looking pretty sad, pretty hung over. And apparently he just worked at this job when he damn well felt like it. He was supposed to be responsible for all of Japan and Okinawa and <laughs> nothing was happening. And our distribution and sales through Suntory were not prospering very much simply because nobody was in charge of it. So came as far as Hong Kong and I got down there and I, I realized that uh, he was uh, he was busy in every bar and I so I just canned him. Uh -huh. Had you known him or known about him? In, I didn't in the know Corps? him in the Marine Corps. I uh -huh. we talked about what did he he had I think he got to Korea. I don't know what happened there. How he, this was after Korea. Would have been after Korea, yeah, yeah. by then. Because I went out there in '69, and I think by that time he'd come back from Korea and gotten this job with with. Uh, I there was some rumble that he had been had some CIA connection, yeah. but I I never he never. I was going to ask you, to Barry, if that anything like that ever materialized. Yeah. I had heard stories. He was a very too. pleasant guy, you know, great to be with and party with, but. Jesus, if you wanted any work done, forget it. <laughs> I realized why they needed somebody in the Pacific Division, and I was told when I came out there, you probably want to get rid of this fellow Spencer. He's an old China hand and whatever. Well, I got down to Taipei, and Spencer had been with Coca-Cola for years and really knew the soft drink business. He knew every 7-Up bottler in Asia, which was perfect for me because I was approaching them to take on a cola and we eventually opened up Hong Kong and uh, Guam and uh, we opened up 7-Up in Indonesia and just mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what well, we opened up 29 bottling operations in 11 countries mm. we were busy <laughs> did you get involved at all with the Tokyo Olympics when that came along yeah I was an interpreter with the US team really for the team well, see, I was out there, that's what the main reason Pepsi sent me out there was to handle the Olympics for them. I joined Pepsi in 63, and they said, okay, in the Marine Corps, I had worked with the Marine Athletic Program at Quantico, and we ran a thing called the, the Quantico Relays, the Relay Carnival, and we invited every major university on the East Coast to come bring their track team down there at their expense, we fed them and housed them and provided all of the comp competitive situations. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the first big outdoor meet of the East Coast. The weather at Quantico was better than, better than <laughs> Massachusetts <Boston>. or <laughs> Ohio. So we had good turnouts and, and I worked very closely with that. With the, and it was, the mate was officiated by uh, uh, NCAA people. And I got to know all of these senior NCAA people, so I was given consideration for being the Olympic attache, but uh, the guy they finally gave it to was a guy who had been MacArthur's aide. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I simply checked in with these with the Olympic officials when they got on board and they said, oh, well, you're an interpreter, you're with us. Uh -huh. Okay. 
So you got to switch to a new vocabulary. Not totally new, but... <laughs> no, I, I knew about the athletic <laughs> stuff from my work at, at Quantico. Andrew, I'm thinking, we're... Yeah. we're oh, do you have any questions you, you want to ask? No, we, we uh, chit-chat around here. Hmm? 